Okay, I see the live is up. Sergeants, will you begin your recordings? Cloud is up. Backup is rolling. Thank you, Sergeant Martinez. You may begin with opening. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council committee hearing of the Committee on Higher Education. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Welcome to today's virtual oversight hearing on adjunct faculty employment at the City University of New York. I'm Councilmember Inez Barron, Chair of the Committee on Higher Education. We last conducted a joint hearing on CUNY adjunct faculty one year ago today. At the time, the university testified that it had been greatly impacted by the pandemic, which necessitated, quote, serious budget cuts, end quote, including reductions to personnel. Accordingly, a vacancy review board established in April 2020, reduced payroll costs by keeping vacant or consolidating the responsibilities of existing purse positions, saving CUNY $33 million in annualized costs as of September 2020. This represented a reduction in full-time staffing levels by 486 positions. Campuses determined uh, that it had to decline, decline to renew the appointments of approximately 2,800 adjuncts. CUNY testified that a decline in enrollment had resulted in $52 million loss in revenue, in addition to $32 million loss revenue for the spring 2020 semester. Additionally, CUNY spent almost $75 million on unplanned emergency costs related to the pandemic. In the 12 months since that hearing, campuses have reopened for in-person instruction and the university has received additional public funding. But we continue to hear about layoffs that appear to be disproportionately impacting black and brown employees who are losing their employment and benefits as we continue to crawl out of the pandemic. Meanwhile, I'm also hearing that class sizes have ballooned for remaining instructors. At today's hearing, I'm interested in learning about current adjuncts, laid off adjuncts, and rehired adjuncts, as well as the status of continuing education teachers. I want to take a deep dive into what is driving the school's decisions and to know how it is impacting all students. Students who may have lost out on the opportunity to take a certain class, or declare a particular major. Students who have found themselves a little lost in bigger classes and continuing education students who have lost access to English language courses, for example. I have lots of questions for all of you, but first I would like to uh, say, I wanna give thanks to Mr. Omawali Clay, my chief of staff, Ms. M. Indigo Washington, my director of legislation and CUNY liaison, uh, Ms. Chloe Rivera, the committee's senior policy analyst, Ms. Amy Briggs, counsel to the committee, and Michelle Perrigan, the committee's financial analyst. And I want to do it, I want to acknowledge we've been joined by council member Alan Mazel, and as others join and I'm notified, I will announce them as well. I will now turn it over to the committee counsel, Amy Briggs, who will review some procedural items on today's hearing and call the first panel. 
Thank you, Chair Barron. My name is Amy Briggs, and I serve as counsel to the Committee on Higher Education at the New York City Council. I'll be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, please remember that everyone will be on mute until I call on you to testify. And after you're called on, you will be unmuted by the host. Note that there will be a few seconds delay before you are unmuted and we can hear you. For public testimony, I will call individuals up in panels. Please listen for your name, and I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, the, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant of Arms will set a, set a clock and give you the go-ahead to testify. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. testimony. At today's hearing, the first panel will include representatives from the City University of New York, followed by council member questions, then public testimony. For today, speaking on behalf of the administration, we will have Dr. Dan Lemons, Interim Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost, and Matthew Sapienza, Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial, Financial Officer at CUNY. I will now administer the oath to the administration. When you hear your name, please respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. So, Dr. Lemons and Mr. Sapienza, do you can affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Um, Dr. Lemons? I do. Thank you. Mr. Sapienza? Do you? I do. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Dr. Lemons. You may begin your testimony once a member of the staff unmutes you. Good morning, Chairperson Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify before you on these important issues around adjunct faculty employment at the City University of New York. My name is Daniel Lemons and I have the privilege of serving as the interim executive vice chancellor and university provost for the City University of New York. It's clear that CUNY is emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic and will in some significant ways be transformed as a university. One that is well positioned, not only meet the challenges ahead, but prepared to take advantage of new opportunities. However, we must also accept the reality of the pandemic has left its mark on CUNY and higher education in general in ways that will require further recovery. One of the most significant roles that CUNY and nearly all colleges across the nation truly was dealt by the pandemic was a swift decline in student enrollment, primarily at community colleges. Cascade effect of this drop in enrollment inevitably led to closure of course sections which ultimately and unfortunately left CUNY College with no choice but to re reappoint a large number of adjuncts in 2020 that it had under normal circum circumstances, that is, to not reappoint. CUNY values its professors who serve as educators and mentors who are nearly 500,000 students across the 25 campuses in every borough of New York City. Decision to not reappoint even one adjunct, especially an adjunct who's a recipient of employer-based health insurance during a pandemic, is not something the university takes lightly. As an example, as president of Lehman College, I worked to combine classroom instruction with other important student-focused work, such as tutoring, provided appointments with sufficient hours for adjunct faculty members would other eyes have not been able to maintain health insurance. And doing that was able to prevent any faculty members from not being uh, continued uh, with an appointment and therefore they, they were all able to maintain their health insurance. However, an unavoidable fact about higher education is that part-time instructor employment shares a dependent relationship with enrollment. And with a sharp attrition in enrollment in 2020, coupled with budget constraints also sparked by the pandemic, CUNY has left no choice other than to not reappoint part-time faculty members 
in a greater number than would be usual. Difficult decision is necessitated, necess necessitated not only by enrollment declines, but also by new budget realities. Nevertheless, the decision to not reappoint faculty is not a decision that can be made lightly or without an understanding of its impact. We recognize that CUNY is more than a university. It's a vital anchor institution. It works towards the betterment of the city and the state as an inward engine of upward social mobility for its students. And it's a major employment pipeline for New York, as well as being a world-renowned hub for ingenuity and innovation. In spring 2020, CUNY was able reallocate funding to reappoint 81% of the adjuncts who've been receiving health insurance that were laid off pre-pandemic. To amplify these reappointment efforts, CUNY worked assiduously to acquire philanthropic funding, specifically to rehire as many adjuncts as funding would make possible. So in July, 2020, CUNY received a historic $10 million grant from the Andrew Mellon Foundation. And of that gift, 500,000 is dedicated to matching the reallocation of an additional 500,000 from the budget of the central office of the university to maximize the number of course sections in fall 2020. Those are course sections that had previously been offered by non reappointed adjunct faculty. So a total of $1 million investment is allocated to the campuses based on an equitable model that would seek to maximize the number of students impacted and the number of previously non-reappointed faculty who could be brought back to CUNY campuses. With this generous support from the Mellon Foundation, CUNY was empowered to recruit and hire 913 adjunct instructors. In total, these adjunct instructors served 3,815 students throughout nine of CUNY's 25 colleges. The hiring these, of these instructors was crucial in continuing the university students' learning advancement during the disruption that we've all experienced from the COVID-19 pandemic. In fall 2021, this term, CUNY reopened its campuses for in-person learning. Now more than ever, our students seek the knowledge, wisdom, and guidance of their adjunct instructor. And so, Re-engaging the part-time instructors being lost in 2019 and 2020 is paramount as a CUNY priority. More than that, instructors who stayed on or have been reappointed over the past year have had an opportunity to engage in high-quality, innovative training for online and hybrid teaching. In May 2020, CUNY School of Professional Studies Studies launched its online teaching essentials program, we call OTE which focuses on providing faculty of all disciplines tools and skills they need for supplying our students with the best education during the COVID pandemic. The program has gone through multiple iterations evolving through the changing demands on our students through the different stages of the pandemic. And I'm pleased to report thousands of our faculty have participated in this training. And in 2020, the program was a recipient of the prestigious UPCA Mid-Atlantic Region Award for Innovative Programs, which recognized CUNY as a paragon of online teaching best practices. Time current priority for CUNY is the safety of the working conditions for all of our community. Since the early days of the pandemic, CUNY's Office of Facilities enacted a multifaceted safety plan across the 25 campuses to ensure hygienic work and learning environments that would greatly limit transmission of the coronavirus. The fall 2021, part of this plan included any mandate that all students enrolled in in-person and hybrid courses must provide proof of vaccination for COVID-19. And I'm pleased to report that to date, over 92% of our hybrid online students provided such documentation. Along with the vaccination mandate, CUNY has developed a rigorous COVID-19 testing program for faculty, staff, and visitors, as well as students who receive religious and medical exemption from the vaccination. As of the last round of tests, 
positivity rate among our campuses remained at just 0.2 percent. That's a remarkably low number for any higher education institution. It is one tenth of the city's positivity testing rate. A CUNY campus is one of the safest places you can be. The outcomes of CUNY's vaccination mandates, testing results, and facilities updates heartens us as a university and imbues us with the confidence to invite the vast majority of our community back to our campus where faculty can connect with students face-to-face -face and on a more personal, engaged way. One opportunity the pandemic has allowed was for CUNY to accelerate its online and hybrid course delivery modalities and such a reshaping of our course modalities has been beneficial to many of our students who see the online learning environment as convenient for their work schedules and their lifestyles. It's added the basis we already had to expand the flexibility of how our curriculum is accessed by our students. However, we recognize that it's also true for many CUNY students who benefit more from in-person learning and in fact require it for successful academic progress. The need for more in-person class contact with instructors is most acutely felt by our first and second year students, as well as our community college students. This observable need for engagement and the opportunity to reestablish the social connections and reforge a sense of community has been the foundation of CUNY's decision to have far more on-campus presence from all of our instructors in this coming spring term. As I said earlier, university part-time hiring has a direct relationship with student enrollment. Nationally, enrollment in colleges has suffered a steep drop in numbers. CUNY has not been immune to this national trend. Ever since this decline emerged, CUNY has committed itself to a proactive plan to reverse the loss of students and regain lost ground. It's important to remember that CUNY's 2019 enrollment numbers were at a record high. And let me just interject in terms of records. We just got our numbers yesterday. This past spring, CUNY graduated the largest number of students it ever has in its entire history. 56,000 students, bringing to over half a million the number of graduates in the past decade from CUNY. But it was clear that, that CUNY um, was a top choice for hundreds of thousands of students as an institution that would afford them a high quality education and propel them upward socially. So our attrition in the enrollment numbers is not reflective of a fundamental lack of CUNY. It instead is part of a national trend that we're just beginning to understand at a more granular local level. In March, 2021, CUNY assembled an enrollment task to devise and deploy a dynamic enrollment recovery plan. But before such a plan can take shape and solutions can be applied to the problem, we have to truly understand the nature of the problem. It's clear that the pandemic is a part of CUNY's decline in enrollment. But just a cursory look at our extensive internal data paints a picture that is more complicated to fully comprehend at this moment. For instance, the greatest attrition in enrollment numbers is most significantly observed in our community colleges. Our most current internal data reveals a decline in community college enrollment of about 14%, which is almost identical to the national 14.1% decline. And as much as we have the number in front of us, we're still working to understand why prospective students are now turning away from community college education and a path to an associate's degree. And we need to learn exactly where these prospective students are going, directly into the workplace, the vocational schools, or elsewhere. Another serious concern with community college enrollment is the decline in enrollment for Black students. The reason for Black student Enrollment declines at community colleges are complex, not well understood by anyone at this point. If they were, this would not be a national trend with an overall decline in Black student community college enrollment over the last two years 
33%. In an email to the publication Inside Higher Ed, Mamie Voigt, who's the interim president of the Institute for Higher Education Policy said, the decline in community college enrollment signals an equity problem because students of color are the very students who are most likely to start their higher education pathway at a community college. And she adds, the months since March 2020 have laid bare more than ever before the social inequities along racial and social economic lines. The pandemic exacerbated the decline in black student enrollment, but it didn't create it. There are systemic conditions of longstanding and we need to understand how they are contributing to decisions about pursuing college and then develop responses that will overcome them and create pathways to degrees, credentials, and success. A critical strategic step now is to gain a better understanding of the reason college is not a choice for many Black men. At CUNY, we're launching a major pilot initiative, the Bronx Health Demonstration Project, to create a comprehensive approach to student well being, a factor that we know greatly impacts continuing enrollment and graduation. We believe this approach will help, but it will not solve the underlying systemic inequity that seems to have been escalated by the pandemic. Finney launched the largest debt forgiveness program in the country eliminating outstanding tuition and fees owed to CUNY for over 52,000 students and amounting to $95 million. These, fund, these students will be able to enroll for the spring without those debts standing in the way, and that will create demand for appointing part-time faculty members. This fall and the coming spring, students will receive, receive $400 million in direct support from the federal stimulus funds. This support will further bolster students who want to continue or begin their higher education and will generate again the demand to hire part time instructors to teach them. The reason I speak about this today is to offer the committee a more complete portrait of the environment with which CUNY and higher education now contends and to contextualize for the committee the nature of CUNY's adjunct reemployment action plan. In short, the university's bold action on enrollment will translate to greater need for faculty to teach classes, and adjuncts will certainly be reappointed to fill this need. The challenges presented by enrollment declines, along with those leveled at us from COVID-19, may seem formidable. However, given CUNY's innovative spirit and the unshakable commitment to emerging from the pandemic as a national model of a modern university, I believe that in the foreseeable future, we'll see a resurgence of students enrolling in our schools and an ardent dedication to a major recoup of the highly valued and well-esteemed adjunct instructors. Thank you for this opportunity to report to the committee today. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Matthew Sapienza. Mr. Sapienza, you may have begin your testimony once you're unmuted. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee. I am Matthew Sapienza, CUNY Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about adjunct faculty employment at the City University of New York. We value very much the critical contribution of our adjuncts, which was underscored in the collective bargaining agreement that was announced in October 2019 an agreement that called for adjunct pay per course to be historically increased. The contract with the Professional Staff Congress, the PSC, was agreed to within the first six months of Chancellor Matos Rodriguez's administration and reflects his and the university's resolute commitment to our tens of thousands of faculty and staff whose talents and dedication are critical to CUNY's ability to remain the nation's premier urban public university. Of particular note, this collective bargaining agreement included groundbreaking economic and structural advances for our 12,000 adjunct faculty members. In addition to significant increases in adjunct pay that will reach 71% in the final year of the contract, the contract's provisions move CUNY forward in its efforts to fully integrate our outstanding part-time faculty into campus life. 
Among other things, these provisions restructured workloads to enable our faculty to devote more time to working individually with students and to professional development and other activities that play a key, key role in our students' success. The layering on of the challenges created by the pandemic to our already existing financial needs has created a unique and difficult fiscal environment for the university. The budget reductions from the city of New York have been extremely challenging to our campus's finances, especially those of the community colleges. The city allocated a reduction of $20 million in the last quarter of fiscal year 2020 when the, when the pandemic first arrived in New York. For fiscal year 21, the city's cut to CUNY was $46 million. Despite the city's improved financial plan, the reduction to CUNY actually increased for the current year to $67 million. Therefore, the cumulative reduction from the city to CUNY's budget since the onset of COVID-19 is $133 million. These substantial reductions from the city have had a significant impact on our community colleges, who as a result of the pandemic have suffered unprecedented enrollment losses over the past two years. While this is a statewide and national trend for community colleges, the large loss of tuition revenue combined with increasing cuts from the city have placed a tremendous financial strain on our community colleges. The allocation of federal stimulus funds has helped all of our colleges, especially the community colleges, through the challenges of the pandemic. While we are extremely grateful for this infusion of funds, it is important to point out that the federal stimulus funds are one-time allocations. These dollars are not part of CUNY's ongoing base budget and will not be available once they are spent. Therefore, each federal stimulus dollar that our community colleges have had to use to cover city budget reductions is one less dollar that is available to provide additional support for their students. It is important to note also that the pandemic has added significant costs to the community colleges, including those for health and safety measures on college campuses, additional health and wellness services for students, training for faculty to enhance their proficiency in delivering instruction to students in a remote environment, and investment in technology to provide the capacity for both faculty and students to teach and learn remotely. The pandemic has changed permanently the nature of higher education delivery and CUNY must adapt. The federal stimulus funds are also helping the colleges do that with investment in additional professional development, the development of online programs, and the creation of hybrid classrooms. The university and its colleges have been very strategic and student-centric in the use of federal stimulus allocations. In addition to the investments in enhanced and changing operations, CUNY has already dispersed $235 million in student emergency grants, and we will be allocating another $400 million this academic year. Moreover, the CUNY Comeback Program, which was rolled out this past summer, has so far relieved about $95 million in pandemic-related debt to over 52,000 students, enabling students to continue degree pursuits. At its meeting on October 25th, the university's Board of Trustees approved the university's fiscal year 2023 budget request. The university is seeking $416 million in additional operating expenses and $1.2 billion in capital budget investments. Our largest single operating budget priority is to increase the number of full-time faculty positions, including lecturers, and to reduce reliance on a part-time teaching workforce. The fiscal 23 budget request seeks $94.1 million for 1,075 new full-time faculty lines, 500 of which would be dedicated for new lecturer lines. If funding is secured for this initiative, it is our expectation that some of these lecturer positions would be filled from our existing adjunct faculty. This investment will allow for greater stability in course offerings, student mentoring, and will create a career pathway for our faculty. CUNY's faculty have made numerous and important contributions in their respected fields and continued, continued investment further strengthens the university. Jeff Person Barron and all of us at the university very much appreciate your continued leadership and this committee strong and continuing advocacy for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sapienza. Before we turn to questions, I would just like to remind both um, administrative speakers to make sure that your microphones are unobstructed. We've just had some issues being able to hear you, um, but 
We'll now turn to Chair Barron for questions. Uh, thank you very much. I wanna thank the panelists who've come before us before uh, for your testimony and for your working with CUNY to make sure that we have improvements that benefit all of our students and populations and recognizes the great work that the faculty is doing. So I have several questions. Um, regarding adjunct professors, what is the current number of adjunct professors that CUNY is using, has on staff? Chair Barron, the, the typical number over the last number of years has been 12,000 uh, in that range. And uh, we're, we're pretty close to that. Those are all professors or those are all on the professor, professorial line, 12,000? Those are, those are all adjunct or part-time instructors, yes. Well, that's, I'm not, to... that's not um, non-teaching, that's, that's our adjunct. You, you muted at the end. So that, that is, um, those are part-time instructors, very in classroom instructors. And those are not, those are combined non-teaching as well as teaching? I'm trying to get that, to the- Yeah, that, those are the teaching, those are teaching instructors. Those are teaching, just so there are 12,000 teaching. Yes. Adjunct professors. I couldn't hear you, you went mute again. Yeah, Ch Chair Barron, um, I'll, I'll, I'll try that one since the Provost Lennon is having, having some um, issues with the mic. Um, on the adjuncts, there are um, different levels of adjuncts. There are professor lines and there are adjunct lecturers as well. Right. So we can provide you the breakout of the 12,000 in terms of how many are adjunct professors, how many are adjunct lecturers right. um, at all the different levels of, of adjunct teaching. We'll get that information to you. And, and along with that, I'd like to have it disaggregated by college, by department, by race, ethnicity, and by gender. Because so I'd like to see where, where these adjunct positions are. I want to see if there are some schools that have more bunched in a particular level than in others, and that would help us to understand that. And how does the number compare to 2020? 2019 and 2018 going back, how does the number of adjuncts that you have in all of those capacities compare to previous years? I think um, over the last few years, our number of adjuncts have been fairly stable. Um, and as Provost Lennon said, it's been around that 12,000 number. Um, and for the last few years, that's been fairly stable in terms of the total number of adjuncts that we've had. Chair Barron, I'll, I'll try again. Are you able to hear me? Okay. Now I can hear you, yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry that it's been a little difficult. So another way, I guess, to answer your question, would, because I know this has really been a lot of the focus and the concern, is around the non reappoint uh, uh, adjunct instructors who have been uh, employed in the previous term. And um, going over those numbers um, in the, in the, over the last week or two, um, to give you an idea, um, the, the non-reappointment um, adjuncts from the previous year for, for this fall is 1,600, around 1,600. Um, and that compares to um, the previous years that, and going back to the last two years, um, 2020 to 2021, that number was about 20,050. And about what? What was that number? That was 20,050. And then um, going back to the last year that we, that, uh, before the pandemic, which it probably is a good comparison year for us. Um, it, the, the number of non-reappointments that year was uh, 1809. 
So uh, it's, it actually has remained like the total limits and remained fairly stable. Um, it does fluctuate um, and uh, you know, that's an overall number. So if you're asking about you know, breaking it down by the different areas, we'd have to go back and, and do that. I don't have those numbers today. But, um, but I think that does give another sort of view on um, the numbers of part-time instructors and those that are not reappointed. And one of the things that I think it's always important to remember about non-reappointment of instructors is um, there are many reasons for non-reappointment. And, and one of them is that there are always a certain number of part-time instructors who just decide they don't wish to come back or to teach in a given term. Uh, move away from the New York area. We know that that happened uh, probably to a larger degree during the pandemic. So there are a variety of reasons for that that, um, that are not related to what way I think has been really the focus of concern, which is the financial impacts on the budgetary impacts. So what is the net difference in uh, the adjunct faculty? Some are non-reappointed, but then I would imagine that there are new appointees that are made, new persons that come in. So what's the net change in that? So for this year, if you say there are 1,600 currently who have not been. That's re- right. And in so, previous, going back to the year where there were, I think you said 1,809, that was not a loss of all of those positions, I would imagine, because you're telling me that the number stays basically the same. So basically then those 1,800 were replaced by new people who came in? So um, that's where there would be fluctuation because that would be the case in, in some cases, yes. There would be other, uh, other adjuncts rehired and, and or hired, I should say. And one of the, you know, one of the variables uh, that we deal with every term, if you look at the way enrollments happen, we, we will start enrolling for instance, for next fall before too long, we're rolling for the spring. So um, what happens is that there's this over, it's really a five month period of time roughly in which students are enrolling. And over that whole time, of course, the enrollments increase and increase and increase, even up through and past the first day of classes. So mm-hmm. we'll still have some enrollment that will come in that first week of classes when students are still able to, to do that. So that period of time, particularly the few weeks before or the month or two before as we're watching enrollments continue to grow, there's a lot of adjusting that has to be made and different because there's demand for certain course sections is not the expected demand for others. Some of it is very predictable, some of it is less predictable. So that's where there's a lot of fluctuation in in part-time hiring because uh, we actually can't really know a lot of that until we get closer to the beginning of the term. But yes, at that point, there would be the hiring of both some of the the part-time faculty members who are not initially appointed and also some new ones. Okay, Uh, so how many faculty members were not reappointed? That's the term that CUNY likes to use. What, how many were not reappointed? I know that there's still 1,900 remaining, but what was that uh, initial number of those who were not reappointed? So um, the, I mean, the, the, the number of non-reappointed faculty, those are the numbers that I gave, and you're referring to the part-time faculty, correct? Yes. Yeah, so that, those are the numbers that I, that I gave you. I think what you're, you're trying to get at is the net, right? You're trying to get yes. at, and I actually don't have that number for you um, because um, I don't think we've quite looked at it that way in terms of you know who, what's the new the new hiring basically in that field, right? That's what you're really getting. At. Right, but I think that that would be an important number for CUNY to keep. Uh, in their view, if you're talking about, you said your goal is to get back to where you were. So I think that that number would be an important number to have as you're going forward with your plans and with your goals. Um, And talking about the adjunct 
faculty members that again, well, you said you'll give it to me disaggregated. So that was what I wanted to know. What has been the financial impact of COVID-19, the financial impact of COVID-19 on the number of persons that you have been able to uh, bring back or that you've not been able to bring back? I think, you know, um, it's, it, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dan. Um, you know, actually, I think, Matt, you should go ahead first in terms of finance, and then I'll, I'll follow sure. up with the kind of more academic aspects of that. But I'll just say, it, to preface that, is can be difficult to tease that out because there are a variety of reasons why we end up with the number of adjunct faculty members that we do. Yeah, Chair Barron, just in terms of overall big picture, and I, I'll you know drill down as, as far as you would like, but um, in April 2020, when the pandemic first arrived here, and we had some real big uncertainties regarding um, our funding, our funding from the state and city, regarding our enrollment, regarding other revenue sources that we have. Um, that our colleges generate from things from like their performing arts centers, the cafeterias parking, all of those things. Um, since all of those things were at risk back in April 2020, we weren't sure what our financial situation was going to be going forward. We implemented um, what we call the Vacancy Review Board. Mm -hmm. um, and the Vacancy Review Board went through every single um, action that colleges asked for in terms of filling positions. And so um, we didn't do layoffs or anything like that, but we did have savings through attrition. As people left, there were some positions that we decided oh. we weren't going to fill, or that colleges decided as well. So from that point, um, April 2020 until um, the end of September 2020, I'm sorry, September 21, <laughs> that year and a half oh. so time frame. Um, we're down um, a little over a thousand positions, a thousand and sixty nine positions it was. Um, so we had nineteen thousand and change full time employees and went down to eighteen thousand and change full time employees. So there were savings through attrition that we did generate. We've now um, the chancellor has asked uh, that the vacancy review board has done its work. Um, you know, we're through that that pandemic period and hopefully getting into recovery period. So, there's no longer a vacancy review board, but obviously we're still going to be monitoring colleges, staffing, and spending levels closely um, as we're still in a in a very challenging period. But there were savings that were generated um, through attrition and through not backfilling certain you know, vacancies of full time positions during the pandemic period. And do you have that amount? Can you tell us what that amount is? Savings that yeah. Were the, the yes, thank you, Chairman. It's a good question. Of the thousand and sixty nine positions, equates to about seventy one million dollars in annual savings going forward. Seventy one million dollars. Mm -hmm. And what are the plans for that seventy one million dollars? Where are we going to see that seventy one million dollars uh, designated in the budget? Well, we're, we're hoping going forward that some of that can be um, used to for investment or to backfill some of those jobs um, that, that were not filled. I think a lot will be contingent on um, what the budget situation will look like at, for the state and city and, and how that will impact on CUNY going forward. And then I think the other big key is um, what is our enrollment going to look like? Um, our four-year college enrollment has been fairly stable. Um, this past fall, it was down a little bit. Um, but as Provost Lemons said in his testimony, we're very concerned about the community college enrollment. Um, and again, and as I mentioned in my testimony, it's a nationwide trend. It's, a, it's certainly a trend throughout New York State that community college enrollment has suffered greatly as a result of the pandemic. Um, so especially for the community colleges, if that doesn't bounce back and um, we don't get the additional support we're seeking from the state and city. Those savings might have to be used just to cover shortfalls. Um, but again, we're hoping that um, that both um, from tuition revenue, and state and city support, that those supports will be there and that we can use some of this 71 million for investments. What is the reduction in the number of teaching adjunct faculty correlate with the reduction uh, in the courses that are offering? 
So we've lost faculty, uh, and how do we? How does that correlate to reduce course offerings? Um, I can't give you the exact numbers, but I, I can tell you that those do correlate. Because, and this goes back to, I think, what's- You said you couldn't give me the numbers, but you could tell me. Yes, but, I, but, I, but they definitely are correlated, Chair Barron. Uh, which is what you would expect, right? Because um, as, because the driving, the main driver for part-time hiring, part-time instructors is, de is the demand for course sections that we're not able to staff otherwise. And so there, those definitely are connected. And so as, an, as enrollment goes up, we will hire more part-time instructors. As it goes down, we will hire fewer. And can you describe then for me the impact on academic majors and on students because of this reduction? And do we, can you give me a number as to course offerings that we can say have been reduced or eliminated because of the redu reduction in the um, adjuncts? So I think that is, that's something that is very difficult to answer in a straightforward way, just because there isn't a straightforward answer. Um, because the hiring of the part-time faculty really is determined by the student demand for those courses. So for instance, if we have a major um, or maybe even a general education course where we have more students wanting to register both for those courses, then we have sections to open up a section we will very often need to hire a part-time instructor to teach that section because we need to respond to that demand. Students can't progress through the general education part of their, of their education or into their major if they can't get the courses. So the hiring is very much linked to that student demand. So I, I understand the reduction in the number of uh, sections that are being offered. And I'm also, which of course means it puts a strain on those remaining instructors because they have larger class, larger class loads, uh, class sizes. I'm also particularly interested in were there instances where a course was not offered, not just the section, the fewer sections and you have to, I'm talking about eliminating uh, a particular academic course. There definitely were, were situations and places where a course was not offered because, uh, and there were budget constraints, you know, in the past year. Um, there, by and large, that's not what happened because we really were responding to what was happening with enrollment. Again, this is mostly at community colleges, as, as uh, Vice Chancellor Sapiens has said, senior colleges were pretty stable, but um, at the community college level, due to that enrollment, there was a drop in the number of sections that were offered. Um, and there, there definitely were some situations where there were courses, sections that were not offered. And this was really, this was due to the budgetary constraints that we had. But those were, those are really not very many. Uh, I can't give you the number of those, but it was, it was not very many. Can we find that number, particularly in terms of not just the, not, not just the sections, but that's one thing. But can we find the number of courses that were? I can try to find that. Yeah, I. Um, it, it might be a difficult number to come by again because there are a number of factors that are behind offering course sections. But we definitely could try to, to come back to you with that number. Okay, good. And what percentage of courses are currently being taught? by adjuncts at each campus? Again, I could uh, get back to you with that number. I don't have it in front of me, um, but we, we, do, we do have that breakdown. Would we find that there are more adjuncts concentrated at the community colleges than at the senior colleges? Would that be the case? I would have to, I would have to come back to you with that. Uh, again, we, I, can, I can definitely, answer that question. I just need to get back to you, um, go back and look at the data and, and okay. report to you. 
Thank you. Uh, moving on to continuing education, uh, teaching teachers. Uh, to date, well, you'll be, when you give me the breakout, I'll see how many of those who were not reappointed were continuing education teachers and um, how much, when you, when you said there was $71 million in savings, that's with all of the adjunct positions. Is that right? You, that's a no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Shireen. The $71 million related to the amount that we saved from the reduction in full-time staff. Oh, okay. So what about adjunct? Okay. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, adjunct, um, you know, expenditures and, you know, because of my role, I, I focus more on expenditures more than staffing, but in terms of expenditures, we spent $309 million in fiscal 21 on adjuncts, and in fiscal 21, we spent $306 million. So it was, a, it was a $3 million reduction, which equated to about a 1% reduction in adjunct spending between 20 and 21. Okay, so the 3 million is for adjunct savings. Okay, mm -hmm. okay thank you. I'm sure. Glad I have that distinction. Uh, a few more questions. The correlation between the reduction in continuing education and the programming, if we could, again, break down how this loss or how this consolidation affected the programming and how many programs might have been eliminated or reduced, particularly through the continuing education program? Because we're talking about really having an impact in the community when we talk about these continuing education programs. And are there any plans to bring back those program offerings which might have been eliminated because of the uh, reductions? So Chair Barron, the um, the continuing education offerings that we have, which actually are generally pretty significant. You know, we talk about a half million Phoenix students and uh, almost half of those are in those kinds of programs. So significant number of people, you're right, huge community impact. Those are all really driven by demand. There, there are self-sustaining programs. Um, so they... We offer those in response, and then many of them, for instance, have come about because um, uh, one of the unions will come to us and say, you know, we really would like training um, in this area, and we'll provide it, and then the union will provide the funding for the program, or they're funded by their grant-funded programs, uh, city, state, or even sometimes federal, uh, but mainly city and state. So these are, these are self-sustaining and self-funding programs are really offered uh, in response to demand. And so it's, you know, it's not part of, and, and Vice Chancellor Sapienza can explain that better probably than I can, but, but from a funding basis, uh, it's very different from the regular matriculated student population in the way that it's funded. Okay, um, that's, that's, uh, that answers my question. Can you describe the role of the Research Foundation if any, in running these continuing education programs? What's the role that they play? They may, if, um, if there are grants that are funding those programs, then, um, then the Research Foundation would be managing the, the funding. And so the hiring would be done through the Research Foundation um, and, um, and the salaries would be paid out uh, and managed by the Research Foundation. And, uh, that question comes from previous hearing that we had where it had been posed that perhaps as a way of avoiding health benefits for some of these adjuncts, the funding or the salaries were split between two entities so as to not have the ability to identify a person as being uh, 21 hours and getting those kinds of benefits. So that's the basis for that question coming up because we're still looking at that possibility and making sure that people are not being denied an opportunity because there are two different entities that are paying them. Uh, how has CARES funding been allocated for continuing education program? And I'm particularly interested in this again because we're talking about the community level and people who are coming back to school and getting additional skills that they need. 
Yeah, I know so, it's a good question. The the um, when when the federal government and, and the minister through the U.S. Department of Ed, when they determine how much each college in the entire country and, and the colleges at CUNY, how much they were going to receive, it was done on a formula basis that was based on number of students in, in degree programs. And so adult continuing ed students weren't captured within that amount. And so um, we haven't used federal stimulus money for adult and continuing ed programs. Um, those have been separate, um, but it's really due to how those funds were allocated and, and the, um, the guidelines that were given by the USDOE on how to spend those funds. And what kind of support does the university offer to continuing education programs, uh, administration, perhaps in grant writing or those kinds of aspects of of running the program, what kind of support does CUNY offer them? We have, um, we have a number of tax levy employees that are uh, administering those programs. Uh, not all, as you pointed out, not all, not all the personnel for those programs are coming from tax levy. Some of them are paid off RF from the project funding itself, but we also do have uh, significant investment in those programs and in, in tax levy staffing that we have for them. And Chair Byrne, I wonder if I could step back just one, just one step, uh, just to clarify one thing about the RF funding or the splitting of it, because I, I, I can't really speak to that. That's not something that I've been aware of, but one thing I think it's important, at least might help to understand some of that issue is that uh, since 2015, the Research Foundation, uh, based on federal guidelines, will no longer directly pay the, the salaries for any instructors who are teaching credit-bearing courses. And we have, we have I didn't, enough- I didn't understand what you're saying. They will no longer pay the salary of- uh, for, for instructors for courses that have credit, college oh. credit. So we, and so we, but we do have, quite a few instructors that are paid indirectly from RF funding for teaching college credit courses. But what happens is those instructors are hired on the tax levy as adjuncts, as any other adjuncts would be. And then the departments are reimbursed um, by the research foundation to cover that. But they, so they're, but they're actually just, there's no, they're no different from any other uh, adjunct that's being hired in tax levy. And Chair Barron, if I could just add to that, the majority of revenues that are generated for adult continuing ed run through a tax levy and, and do not run through the RF. As, as Provost Lemon said, if there's a, a particular grant that is administered through the RF that's for adult continuing ed program, then it would, it would run through the Research Foundation. But um, for the community colleges, for example, um, in the city's um, accounting system in FMS, there's a revenue source for adult continuing ed programs, and the revenues that come in are deposited with the city um, for those programs at the community colleges. Okay. Um, a few more questions. How, what is the number of students that a typical uh, teaching adjunct faculty person would have in their class? And what does it compare, how does it compare to pre-pandemic loads? You know, that really varies hugely. Um, it really is dependent upon the type of curriculum and the type of course within the curriculum. So you can imagine, for instance, a writing course that uh, is very instructor intensive in terms of the amount of time, um, would have a much smaller number of students. Um, and it, and I, don't, I don't know that there is, we would find a difference between the full-time faculty and part-time faculty in terms of you know, the, the numbers of students being taught, or uh, it really goes much more by the type of course that they're teaching and the kind of, you know, the, the, what's involved in teaching that course. And just for, you know, an example, um, I mean, we have some very large class sections, for instance, um, that are taught by uh, full-time faculty, probably more by full-time faculty, but not, not necessarily exclusively at all. Um, 
Uh, and, uh, yes, go ahead. And um, what I wanted to say about those is that even though they're very large sections, and we have really great examples of classes like that that have been extremely successful at improving students' graduation from the going through matriculating and going through those courses successfully and getting good grades and being able to move on, really depends a lot on how they're organized. Uh, and so that's kind of, it goes back to the point that class size really is a, it's really much more dependent on the kind of course that it is than it's not really, shouldn't be dependent on what kind of instructor is in that course. That may be, but I know that when you have a, a large student uh, class enrollment, it's difficult to reach every student. And we certainly know that there are some students that can function well, and there are others that are going to need that additional uh, attention or counseling. So um, that may be, but my experience is that in many, and again, it depends on, on the subject matter that you're talking about, but larger class sizes are not beneficial in terms of establishing a rapport with the teacher, with the students, and being able to make sure that students feel that they are contributing. Um, but my question also talks about, have you seen an increase in the load presently from what it was pre-pandemic? I don't think that there is a dramatic increase in the class size you know, from before the pandemic to during the pandemic. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, now, a, another important question, um, have adjunct faculty lost any benefits such as health insurance as a part of the university's efforts to spend down and consolidate and save? So um, I think, um, Vice Chancellor Sapiens can yeah. probably speak to this better than I can. What I can tell you is um, that we know in the two previous years, we, we know there were a certain number of non-reappointed faculty members that would be would have lost health insurance. It was about 155, um, 19 to 20, and it was about 135. 20 to 21. Now it's actually lower than that number because, and I know this from my own experience because at Lehman, we were trying very hard to not have that happen to any part-time faculty. So we had a list of nine part-time faculty members, as I recall, that if they were not given enough uh, teaching hours, would lose their health insurance to CUNY. Um, but what I found is I could only three of those faculty members uh, were still available to teach. The others had either moved out, couldn't reach them. Um, and those that were available, obviously we tried to work that out. We did work it out so that they would have enough hours to retain their health insurance. That, but we know that there are some, you know, it's, it's somewhere below that 155 in the one year and 135 last year uh, for, who, for whom that was the case. So, you know, that's certainly um, very concerning, uh, particularly during this pandemic. Uh, and, and I think we always have to be mindful of, of the human side and the reality. You know, these, the numbers are what they are, but they represent, in fact, people who are- Absolutely. Challenged. Um, just a few more questions. How does CUNY plan on spending the state's one, the, re, the state's recent $100 million allocation? And will part of it go towards, um, towards the 500 conversion, funding the 500 conversion lines or, or not? So Chair Barron, the, the 100 million that I think you're referring to is, um, we were very grateful in the state's um, enacted budget this past April that they included an additional $100 million in capital funding um, for our colleges. Um, and so we are working to develop plans on, on how to use those funds, um, working with our, our new vice chancellor for facilities, who we're really excited is here, Mohamed Atala, and, um, under our direction of our chief operating officer, Hector Batista. Um, so we're working with our campuses to, to develop those plans um, and look forward to bringing 
that plan to the state for uh, final approval. Um, but again, we're, we're really happy to have the $100 million. Um, we have a lot of needs on the capital side. Um, we're hoping that um, we, you know, we'll be able to use it to, to increase capacity in terms of instructional capacity. But I think for each college, um, as we distribute those funds, depending on what the college's needs are um, based on, in terms of their space, in terms of their uh, physical capacity, and in terms of their enrollment, each college will have a different type of need for how we're going to use those funds. Okay. Uh, my staff is uh, helping me get some clarity on information that I intended to ask you. So for the, for the $100 million that you're requesting in the upcoming budget, yes, yes. how are you planning to uh, use that money? Yeah, so we're looking uh, on the operating budget for fiscal 23, um, and we'll make sure that, that you and the other members of the committee and, and folks at City Council Finance have a copy of our budget request that uh, Board of Trustees recently uh, passed. Um, but we're seeking 416 million in additional funding in next year's budget. Um, and the biggest component of that is about $94 million um, for additional full-time faculty. So that's, that's the largest component of that 416 million. It's about 100 million, a little less, 94 million for additional full-time faculty lines, 1,075 uh, 1, additional full-time faculty lines. Um, just again, going back to your good point uh, a couple of minutes ago, Chair Barron, about um, having a full-time faculty person in the classroom and having those um, ability to have more course sections offered by having more faculty um, be a great benefit to our students. And so we're hoping to receive that funding. And then one other uh, quick thing I want to add about that, that, those 1,075, we're seeking that 500 of those would be in the lecturer lines. Um, the lecturer um, position are folks that um, we get greater teacher capacity in terms of the number of courses that they teach. And so I think we can get some, again, more efficiencies and, and be able to create more course sections with lectures and have the benefit of it could be a great career pathway for many of our existing adjuncts who would have an opportunity to apply for those uh, lecturer uh, positions. So we're hoping that we'll be successful in, uh, in securing funds from the state and city for our new faculty hiring initiative. Okay, could a portion of the, and you may have answered it, I was a little distracted, I apologize. No worries. Um, could a portion of the 106.2 million support personal salaries for adjuncts or other CUNY professors for fiscal 2022? Uh, are you referring to the federal stimulus funds, Chair Barron? No, for the money that you're asking. Oh, um, well, we're asking for, um, the money we're asking for is for new, would be for new full-time faculty positions. New full-time faculty. Yes. Mm -hmm. So of those persons who will not be appointed, what provisions or what opportunities will you have to reach back to them to offer them an opportunity to come back? And will they be a part of your planning to be able to bring some of them back to CUNY if that's what they would like to do? For those no. who will be appointed, for not be appointed for financial reasons. I think, you know, going forward, the hiring plan, if we're able to move ahead with the 500 new lecture lines, um, for instance, those are. 500 positions that any of our part-time faculty members, or many of them anyway, would be um, candidates for. And we would anticipate that they would have been in a really good position to obtain those positions. So that's, uh, you know, that, that, that isn't part-time faculty members currently appointed or not reappointed, it's, it's the whole pool that is eligible for that. Okay, um, what are the plans to spend down the remaining balance from the 100, wait, 
I'm not getting these. Let me see if I can get these correct. My eyes are failing as I'm aging and it's challenging to really see this. Uh, we, the committee is requesting a breakdown uh, with a description disaggregated for each community college, a CUNY's plan for the 106.2 million for fiscal 2022. Yeah, for fiscal uh, 22, the, the, the year that we're in now, um, our um, federal stimulus plan was approved by our board of trustees as to how we're, uh, what our plan is to spend those funds. Um, and so we can get that information to you. Um, again, I think a lot of it will be used to help cover um, enrollment losses at the community, at the community colleges. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, another, another big component of it that, again, we're, we're really pleased about and know it, it helped so many of our students is the CUNY Comeback Initiative that relieves students of their pandemic-related right. debt. Um, so those, those are, the, are two of the larger components, but I'm happy to share our um, plan for the community colleges. We know it's a plan and, you know, if the world changes again, we might have to, we might have to pivot, um, but we're certainly happy to get, get you and, uh, and folks at the Council Finance Division the plan. Okay. Um, I think that concludes most of my questions. If there are questions that I have overlooked, I will ask that my team send them to you. And as you've done in the past, that you would respond to those questions. Happy to do that. Okay, thank you. I'll now turn it back to our moderator. So Amy Briggs. Thank you, Chair. Um, Amy. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so we'd like to take a moment to ask if any of the council members present would like to ask any questions to our panelists. I would like to remind the members that if you have not yet done so, please raise your hand in the Zoom and use the raise hand function in Zoom, and we will call on you as soon as possible. Please remember to keep your questions to five minutes. I'll give a brief pause and seeing no question or hands raised, Chair Barron, if you have any other additional questions, we can ask the panel or we can move on to our, our next panel. Uh, I think the other questions I'll formulate and we can send them in writing. All right, thank you, Chair Barron. Uh, we have now concluded CUNY's testimony. We will now turn to public testimony. First, I would like to remind everyone that individuals will be called up in panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your test testimony once the Sergeant at Arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony during this portion will be limited to three minutes. Note that there is a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. And please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before you starting your testimony. In our first panel of speakers, we'll, we'll be hearing from, pardon while I get this list up, um, Mr. James Davis, Rosa Skiliante, and Linda Pelk. James Davis, you may now begin your testimony. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Barron and committee members for the invitation to testify today about the adjunct members of the Professional Staff Congress at CUNY. I'm James Davis, the PSC president, and I'm here on behalf of 30,000 faculty and professional staff, including some 12,000 who are teaching adjuncts. Another 1,700 CUNY workers are adjunct college lab technicians and non-teaching adjuncts. We are grateful as always for your advocacy on behalf of CUNY students and workers. Joining me on my panel today is Rosa Squillico, Vice President at the PSC for Part-Time Personnel, who will speak about the challenges that our adjuncts and part-time members are facing. And also with me on the panel is a longtime member, Linda Pelk of LaGuardia Community College, who will discuss why programs like the English Language Center, the largest English language program in New York City are essential for immigrant students aiming to matriculate at CUNY. And I'm grateful to see so many other CUNY colleagues here as well to testify after our panel. 
I want to begin my testimony on a couple of positive notes. First, I want to offer congratulations to the CUNY Chancellor for his appointment as a co-chair of the Transition Committee for Mayor-elect Adams. Eric Adams is a two-time CUNY graduate who understands the central role CUNY plays in the city's economy and the life of our students. And second, this year's CUNY budget request, as, as has already been mentioned, um, finally puts the university on a promising path after many years of austerity and disinvestment. The CUNY administration has made a budget request worthy of its students' needs, as well as the faculty and staff. And this hearing allows us to highlight a feature, as was just discussed, of the budget request was the, the intention to provide a defined career pathway for part-time teaching faculty by creating 500 new full-time lecturer positions. So CUNY relies heavily on adjunct labor to meet its instructional needs. In this respect, it resembles other public colleges and universities where contingent appointments without job security have become the norm rather than the exception. But CUNY is a particularly stark instance of the problem. People talk about the gig economy. We have the gig academy. As public resources for CUNY have diminished, the over-reliance on adjunct labor has increased. The university effectively now balances its budget on the backs of a large underpaid contingent workforce. In 2019-2020, according to the university's performance management report, just 41% of undergraduate instruction per full-time equivalent student was delivered by full-time faculty. That means that nearly 59% of instruction Time. was delivered by adjuncts. Chair Barron, could I request one additional minute? Yes, you can continue. Yes, Thank take you. your time. I want to hear your full testimony. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. So this is the lowest rate of full-time instruction at CUNY in at least five years. At the community colleges, full-time faculty actually teach a slightly higher percentage of courses, and I know you asked about this earlier, than at the four-year colleges, but at community colleges as well, they rely heavily on, on underpaid adjunct. So we're hopeful that in this budget request, it's a step in the right direction, and we look forward to working with the new mayoral administration and city council to ensure the city portion is realized. We also look forward to working with CUNY on a method to implement the conversion lines that could move many of our members into permanent full-time work with benefits, while also protecting the jobs of our adjunct members who are not seeking full-time work. The last thing I just want to wrap up with is back in June, you heard my testimony about the devastating impact of COVID on our members and the university. That difficulty was sharpened when CUNY laid off approximately 2,800 adjunct teaching faculty. And I know you were in discussion uh, with university management here about that issue. And thankfully, about 1,000 of those have been rehired. However, attrition has also led to the loss of more than 500 full-time faculty and professional staff over the last 18 months. And many of those who remain face larger rosters in their virtual classes. And again, appreciate your astute observations about the issue with online class size. Um, uh, and there's there really this demand for, for more and smaller classes should create the opportunity for our laid off colleagues to return to the classroom. The last thing, we're in the midst now of ensuring that CUNY provides a safe and healthy return for many of our members back onto campuses. That's entailed a massive health and safety effort among our members, while we're also trying to advocate for accommodations for those who still require remote work. And we ask for your assistance because unfortunately our efforts to obtain ventilation data um, particularly on 10 different campuses, has been impeded by the university. And I won't go through the list because you have it in my written testimony, um, but we've been compelled to submit FOIL requests and we're still awaiting that ventilation information. So I wanna thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Um, and I wanna thank you, especially Chair Barron, uh, as your council term winds down for leading this committee and for your passion for CUNY students and PSC members, you have helped us raise issues of equity and educational justice consistently, and those are critical to our members and to our students. And they'll lay the foundation for your successor in the chair role and for future champions 
for CUNY. So thanks, and I'll turn it over to Rosa and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Rosa Skilakonskut, you may now begin your testimony. Apologize, apologies for your name. For Starting time. It's uh, the story of my life, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Rosa Squillicode and I have been an adjunct at Hunter College since 2012. I am also currently the vice president of part-timers for the PSC. Thank you, Chair Barron, for the opportunity to testify today. I want to start by thanking the CUNY administration for requesting $103 million from the next city budget. Our community colleges desperately need these funds and more in order to rehire laid off workers, reduce class sizes, support continuing education programs, and ensure that all part-time workers are paid adequately. Since the pandemic, class sizes have increased dramatically. While research says that online classes should have no more than 10 or 12 students, I regularly had three times that in my classes over the last year, and I know that other adjuncts had even more. People returning to in-person classes still have increased class sizes, even though we know that not all of CUNY's buildings have adequate ventilation and are made even more unsafe by overcrowded classes. And even though several hundred adjuncts who were laid off at the start of the pandemic haven't been rehired. Adjunct teachers and continuing education teachers, CETs, in the English Language Center at LaGuardia Community College faced similar cuts. Adjuncts were laid off and lost health insurance at the beginning of COVID, and CET workers faced larger class sizes. After a very difficult fight, those adjunct workers were rehired and given health insurance, but now we are learning that some are being denied their contractually guaranteed office hour pay. Continuing education programs, which many part-time workers work in and which are self-funded because the CUNY administration makes that decision, these programs seem to have come under a kind of special attack. Some programs have been outright canceled. The CET workers of the Baruch Continuing and Professional Studies program had classes with 37 or 41 students this semester, far larger than normal. And now in the middle of the semester, they are being told for the first time that the program is ending and will not continue into the spring, leaving workers without a job and students without a program. There is some decline in enrollment at community colleges, but how does that explain class sizes increasing while laid off workers aren't getting rehired? Students are going to be coming back and if these programs are gutted, what are they coming back to? CUNY is an essential part of our city's fabric. When I walk around my neighborhood in like a CUNY sweater, everybody stops me to say, not everybody, but people stop to say, oh, I got a certificate at Bronx Community College. The guy at my bodega across the street is taking classes at Hostos. Um, uh, may I take another minute to finish or? Yes, you may, you can, yes. Thank you very much, my apologies. It is essential to invest in CUNY's community colleges and continuing education programs. And our members who make these programs run deserve to be respected. They deserve a fair wage, small class sizes, and better working conditions. I again thank the CUNY administration for requesting $103 million from the CUNY budget, from the city budget. I urge CUNY to fight for more and to use these funds to support the part-time workers who need support in order to make CUNY what it is, a people's university. Thank you for your time. And thank you again, Chair Barron, for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on Linda Pelk to testify. Starting time. One is my 36th year of teaching at Telk. I had already been teaching for 10 years before I came to LaGuardia Community College in 1987. However, it was at LaGuardia that I found the level of commitment and passion that would define my career, a career that has given me an enormous sense of fulfillment. At LaGuardia, I found commitment and service. Although as an adjunct, I was only paid for 
contact hours, I served on curriculum committees and search committees, mentored new teachers, and gave presentations at national and international conferences. My passion motivated me to pursue two higher degrees, namely a second master's and a PhD, and to keep a constant and consistent connection to my students, both in the classroom, before, during, and after class, and through, through email. To further my professional development, I have taught in teacher training programs in New York, at New York University and at the New School, and I have worked as a teacher trainer staff developer at the New York City Department of Education. Given my status as one of the most senior faculty at TELC, one who has contributed to the development of the program and has men mentored junior faculty throughout the years, I was stunned to learn that in fall 2020, for the first time in three and a half decades at LaGuardia, I was not given any classes in TELC. Instead, new non-adjunct teachers were given these classes. In fall 2021, enrollment went up considerably and most adjuncts who requested classes were given classes. We adjuncts are asking that our experience, expertise, and continual commitment to the program be granted their due. If classes are available, we are asking to be given priority in the distri distribution of classes. Sharon Lund, Associate Director of Recruitment at LaGuardia has recently said in his interview with President Adams, President Adams is president of LaGuardia, it, LaGuardia, is not a community college. It's a college for the community. TELC adjunct lecturers developed an English language program for the community that was thriving. For decades, TELC faculty like myself have consistently demonstrated our dedication to sustaining a program and continuing education for the community. And we feed into the colleges of CUNY with these students that we have trained in English. Time. For decades, just a few more seconds, please. For decades, TELC faculty like myself have consistent, I'm sorry, consistent, and is the contribution of these le adjunct lecturers that will continue to make TELC the vital lifeline needed by the community that we have so proudly and passionately served. Please support TELC. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Chair Barron. If you'd like to ask this panel any questions, I'll turn it to you. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank the panel for coming and giving their testimony. And certainly when uh, the question involves adjuncts, lecturers, instructors, we need to hear, in fact, from those people, those organizations that reflect them and represent them. So we're so glad for you to be here and to share your testimony today. I did want to ask uh, President Davis about any ideas that he has or any uh, insight that he has that he wants to share with us as we look to what CUNY has proposed to do with these 500 conversions lines. Are there anything that we need to be mindful of or to uh, have some oversight of as these conversions are implemented? Thanks for the question. It's, um, it's probably one of the most important ones to ask in this transition um, with the budget request. Um, so I think it's really, really important to exercise oversight about the discrepancy between um, the possible discrepancy between um, converting, right, creating conversion lines mm -hmm. and creating an opportunity for people to apply for lecturer positions. Um, CUNY and they're, you know, Dan and Matt left, but um, they've heard it from me elsewhere. Um, you know, CUNY has expressed it in a certain way in their budget request. And I think what the city council can do is actually make sure that uh, that the conversion lines are actually possible so that it's not a question of adjuncts merely competing 
on an open national market, for example, for, for um, the same positions. So the proposition of conversion lines is a bit different um, and they seem to want to have it both ways in the way they've expressed it in their budget request. Chair Barron, I think that you raised a really important question about um, equity in your line of questioning with the university administration. Um, and I want to I want to also clarify um, something that Rosa pointed out in relation to to this. Um, uh, the, the university's budget request um, actually includes 103 million additional um, city funds, so not total total funds from the city. Just in case that wasn't clear, um, it's additional, so it's above and beyond what the enacted budget right. had in it last year from from the city. Uh, and I think you know you were you were getting at a at a question about the proportion. I I think what the management university management was struggling to understand in your question was this question of equity in um, access to full time faculty at uh, at various colleges across the CUNY system. And I think it's a critical question to ask, and I, I want to be clear in answering it that the question of access to full time faculty is in no way a kind of a negative presupposes a negative judgment about adjunct faculty because mm -hmm. as you just heard from my colleagues um you know and linda expressed it well there's experience mm -hmm. and expertise um i was an adjunct faculty member myself for four years and every time i go around and conduct classroom observations of my contingent faculty colleagues it's striking uh the passion the, the devotion the, the teaching expertise so you know, I just want to be clear about that when we talk about about you know the quote unquote problem with full time versus part time uh, uh, instruction at CUNY. We're not talking about at the individual instructor level. We're talking about a structural issue. I agree. So, I'm glad you made the point. Thank yeah, you. and and it does track. I mean, unfortunately, um, and I see my colleague from the University Faculty Senate, Do uh, Dr. Okome, is here, and maybe she'll address this. What we see when we look at the proportion of full-time faculty members in the CUNY system, unfortunately, it's le you're less likely if you're at a predominantly minority serving institution mm -hmm. to, um, to be able to study with full-time faculty over the course of your career at that institution. And there's a major discrepancy right now, and you're, you may be aware of it, between the SUNY system and the CUNY system. There's a major divergence, and you can track it over the last 16, 17 years it's stark and it does correlate with the racial composition of the colleges. So the colleges like, and, and it's, a, it's a study of the four-year schools, just to be clear. So, and I don't know the way it tracks with the, with the, with the community colleges, but um, you know, Lehman, John Jay, Medgar, New York City Tech and York, the, the, with the highest rate uh, of serving students of color are the least likely um, to, uh, to have a high, high percentage of full-time faculty. So part of that question about conversion really would be to make uh, a higher percentage of full-time faculty at those institutions, um, not only by hiring them from the outside, but also converting it from the amazing ranks of, of part-timers that we currently have. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I did have another question about your concerns, the union's concerns about ventilation. We know that we're back in person on campus. And we did raise the question with CUNY previously about ventilation because the union had raised the question, particularly as they were talking about coming back for in-person learning. So what is the status of that? Have you gotten a response or, uh, and has the response been one that is appropriate and adequate, particularly during this time of a pandemic? Appreciate the question. I'm going to be really brief. We started down this road by asking for uh, the data behind the engineering reports that was provided to the union. So the university had an obligation to provide the engineering reports that showed at a kind of 30,000 foot level what buildings were safe on the campus. That's all well and good. But what we needed to know was actually what's the ventilation levels in the real time workspaces that people were occupying. Not simply is the HVAC system still working according to code, but what does it actually mean on the ground in the library at Medgar Evers? 
are people safe there, right? In the registrar's office at John Jay College, what does it mean? And the university has been absolutely intransigent at providing that information. We believe that they must have it because that's what the engineering reports base their reporting on. It does not inspire confidence, right, in the workers, and I imagine with the students, that the university hasn't been willing to disclose the more granular level information about, about ventilation. So we've tried the OSHA route and they haven't complied with our request based on OSHA and now we're foiling. Um, and so again, it's, it's one of these things where it's like, if they're right and the buildings are safe and there's nothing to hide, just provide the data and then people will be happy to go away and stop clamoring for it, but they're refusing to provide it, which is ra raising, of course, raising red flags. And this is an airborne virus. We're not asking for something gratuitous. We're asking for basic information during an airborne virus pandemic. So appreciate you asking that question. And, um, you know, I, I, I realize that CUNY will say that, you know, we gave the union information. We're, we're asking for local level uh, um, data, you know, as the DOE is actually providing. You know, New York C City DOE is doing this. You can go to a website right now and, and find that data. So we feel CUNY should provide it as well. So thanks for asking. Thank you. Yes, it's always, you know, we're always suspect as to hesitancy on giving information and a lack of transparency. It makes you wonder, well, why are we reluctant to do that? So in, uh, we'll ask as a committee also in our questioning of CUNY, we'll be able to include that. And I do want to acknowledge and thank the other panelists that are there with you. Thank you for your service to CUNY. And thank you for going above and beyond as you talk about the things that you do beyond the contact hours for which you are paid and how you're willing to share your expertise and concern, not just with students, but with colleagues as well. We do thank you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next panel in order of speaking is, will be Moju Baulu Olofunke Okome, Nathan Schrader, Jillian Abbott, Jonathan Hannon. I will now call on Moju Baulu Olofunke Okome to begin testifying. Thank you. Starting time. Uh, good morning. And thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to speak. I think the core issue, I kind of um, um, think some of the core issues here were not um, addressed as much as I would have liked. Um, in especially the testimony from the administration. I think the issue is adjunct faculty appointment and equity within that, um, that um, frame. Also, you know, what marks are left by the pandemic that are structural? you know, in a historical way and which ones were occasioned by the pandemic itself. When I wanted to come, I didn't just base what my remarks on my own experience, but I was, a fac I was a, an adjunct faculty at CUNY in the 1980s when I was a graduate student. The pay and the conditions were so uh, unsuitable for my needs that I went and found a small liberal arts college where I was able to negotiate better pay and condition and I worked there. But I did teach at CUNY as an adjunct faculty member. I also taught at Long Island University and then at this um, small liberal arts college. So I have a little bit of a perspective. I would not claim that I have a global perspective. I've been teaching- I've been teaching at CUNY for 21 years and I administered a program, an interdisciplinary program in which we used, um, we, we, we hired adjunct faculty. I think we have to be aware that there's a lot of um, legitimate reasons why adjunct faculty would feel disaffected, would feel disrespected, would feel, you know, um, a bit unap you know, unappreciated for a lot of the work they're doing. A lot of our colleagues have PhDs 
they have teaching experience. But you know, there's a whole variety of people who come into the adjunct category. Some people are teaching for the love of teaching. Some people, this is their only work and they have to work unbelievably hard to pay their bills, to put food on the table, to not live in a very precarious condition. So I, you know, what, what the administration has said about um, these conversion lines must prioritize. Hiring adjunct faculty. Time. Oh, I'm sorry. Hiring adjunct faculty. The other thing I think needs to be done is to be aware that universities are supposed to have this, um, this um, I mean, our colleges. We want to educate all the people of New York. We want to be the Harvard for the people. You know, how are we living this in terms of how we do our budget priorities? How do we show the people who work so hard to teach our students that we value them, that we respect them? I know for a fact that 66 adjunct faculty were fired at uh, Medgar Evers College. I don't think they've been restored to their jobs. And something needs to be done on this. You know, so we need to kind of put faces, we need to see the global picture, but there are individuals affected by this. And we need to be mindful that as a, as, as a set of universities that claim that we are for the people, we have to act as such. Let's live our values. Let's ensure that the people who are doing all this teaching are able to do so as professionals who are not living in precarious conditions that entail them moving from place to place, you know, and also having their classes canceled at the last moment and losing healthcare benefits and so on. You know, so I will submit my, um, my remarks um, by email. I also think we need to be mindful that CUNY and SUNY are both funded by state and city, you know, um, state and city in, this, in, the, in the case of CUNY, the state in the state of SUNY. There's a faculty gap. CUNY has more full-time faculty per full-time e equivalency per thousand students. And the gap um, is substantial. So if we're not the um, orphan children of New York State and New York City um, governments, we have to be made to feel this in terms of the staffing, the treatment, equitable treatment for all of us, and then enabling for people who are skilled, experienced within our fold and are still in the adjunct category to have more jobs where they have more predictability in terms of their work conditions and how they are rewarded for their efforts. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now call on Nathan Schrader to testify. Time starts now. Uh, hello, thank you, Chair Barron and um, the City Council, and I'm glad to support uh, to be here to offer my uh, testimony um, for your consideration. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, honestly, a lot of the things that I have to say are pretty much the same as what my colleagues have been saying. Um, it's kind of telling that the administration didn't stick around to listen to us, but what's new? Um, so. Uh, as you observed, um, you know, I don't know the numbers myself either, but uh, a number of adjunct and part time faculty are minorities, people of color, uh, women. I am not, but I can maybe uh, give you my experience and as an indicator of the way that part time employees are treated and the type of work that we do and the compensation that we get for it. Uh, so just to give you a, a little example, uh, I am not getting a class appointment in the spring. Uh, that would usually mean a loss of one third of my income. In this case, it means a loss of half of my income. It also means a loss of my insurance. So because I don't get one class, uh, I lose out on over $5,000 and health insurance for the next foreseeable future until I have enough classes to provide for that. Um, 
Also, it's impossible. I mean, the administrators and other people have made points about um, creating more full-time jobs and creating more creating more jobs that would uh, give opportunities for people in part-time positions to move up to full-time positions, but I don't see any of that happening. Um, the only kind of security that we have are sometimes we have uh, we have what's called a three-year contract, which wasn't even honored uh, because of the pandemic. A lot of people under uh, three-year contracts were not given their contractually obligated classes uh, because CUNY simply uh, just uh, did not honor the contract because of the pandemic. And uh, we're coming out of pandemic situations, and I understand that higher education was hit hard, but that's easy when it comes from people who are making half a million dollars a year. All right, for the rest of us, um, you know, um, this has been going back before the beginning of the pandemic, right? The insecurity of whether or not we will get a job in the next semester or the next year, um, the fact that the TELC adjuncts still have not been rehired or have been replaced with uh, workers who are doing the same job for a lower wage kind of shows the direction that CUNY is going with its hiring practices. Save as much money, pack as many students into the classroom as possible, and pay uh, their, uh, their employees as little as possible, offering little to no benefits. Now, that's not beneficial for us, the employees. It's also not beneficial for the students. When I have to teach a class that's capped at 22, 25, or some people have even suggested 27 students in a class. I'll, just um, give me one more minute. I know time is up, but everyone's going over, so I'll wrap up my ideas right here. Um, you know, when we have larger class caps, I mean, research shows that 18 is the ideal number of students in a class, and I know that's a little unrealistic for a public university, but it allows uh, more jobs for adjunct employees like myself and my colleagues, um, and it allows more individual attention to those students to give them the type of education that they need. Um, the administration uh, mentioned training for online teaching, and that's good, but training does not replace income. If that doesn't guarantee that we're given jobs in a given semester and that we lose our insurance, we lose our source of income, we are not able to contribute our knowledge and our skills to our students. And uh, I thank you very much for the consideration. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Jillian Abbott to testify. Starting time. Um, hello, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity and the honor to um, give this testimony today. Um, I'm, I have uh, submitted my written um, testimony, which is longer than three minutes, and I've just done a, a down and dirty edit, so I should, I'm going to try to, I, I should be as close as possible to three minutes. Um, my name is Gillian Abbott. I'm an adjunct lecturer in the English department. Uh, I'm a member of the PSC CUNY Executive Council, and I'm an adjunct senator at the University Faculty Senate, all for uh, representing York College. Um, I speak to you today as a passionate educator and advocate for students, faculty and public edu education. To put it another way, I'm a typical currently serving adjunct. The impact of CUNY's policies have made adjuncts' lives untenable, which in turn affects our students negatively. I also want to share my vision for the path back to CUNY before adjunctification undermined its capacity to deliver quality education the kind of education that could turn a C student into a statesman. Um, I had some very bad news a week ago. A friend of mine who I knew through my artistic life, uh, I had run into her a few years ago. She was teaching at Queen's College. Her name is Liz Foley. Uh, she is a graduate of Smith College. She was a graduate of Smith College and Columbia University uh, in the film school. She was teaching film at Queen's College. She got sick. She became sick, she was let go, and last week I found out she died. So when a CUNY adjunct loses their, this was not COVID. We're, as we get older and we get sick, we're discarded and we die. She did not have health insurance at the time that she died. Um, her part, a CUNY, her passing will not be marked except by her students who have lost her guidance, experience and passion. How many more adjuncts will CUNY students lose? 
It's time for CUNY faculty to unite, celebrate differences and respect the contribution of all. This can only be achieved when adjunct faculty are welcomed into meaningful full-time jobs with equal paying conditions and the prospect of advancement that current full-time faculty enjoy, enjoys. That is, I urge CUNY to end adjunctification and to, to invite currently serving adjuncts into full-time positions. And just as importantly, it is time for CUNY to return to being an organisation based on shared governance, where the voices of all faculty are not only heard, but empowered. Uh, this is not, the situation at CUNY isn't because administrators are necessarily bad people or, or the um, full-time faculty are, are bad people, although um. there has been a lot of abuse of power. It's, it's the whole thing is the organizational structure based as it is on the indentured servitude of adjuncts makes being our best selves almost impossible. This is a structural issue. Um, the work faculty does can have profound effects, impacts on students' lives. The, the CUNY of today, but the CUNY of today is a very different organization. Oh, oh sorry, I, I edited it, so I've got to go back. I, I tried to cut things out. I have to put something back in. Uh, the work faculty does can have a profound impact on students' lives. Last Friday, I watched the funeral of the great statesman and CUNY alum, Secretary of State General Colin Powell. In a moving eulogy, his son Michael said, I've heard it asked, are we still making his kind? The CUNY of today is a very different organisation to that CUNY that educated Secretary Powell. When he came through CUNY, at least 75% of classes were taught by full-time professors. It is very hard to turn a C student into a statesman when you are living in your car or commuting five hours between campuses to earn enough to barely pay your bills. Um, can today's CUNY still catch the would-be Colin Powell's? Oh, well, I know from personal experience that faculty strive to help their students, um, the, but the entire faculty, but particularly those in the classroom are stretched too thin, are too overworked, disenfranchised and economically insecure to be their best selves. Indeed, it's surprising how many promising students we still manage to catch. Although retention and graduation uh, rates point to the many, many students who fall between the gaps. Public education mirrors adjunct struggle to survive. The forces moving to privatize CUNY to give up on government funding and replace it with private money, allowing rich individuals and foundations to determine pedagogical practice and research priorities is a great threat to our future competitiveness. Can I believe I in public education. Can I ask that you wrap your comments up, please? Uh, yes, could I have a little bit more time? I, I cut, I cut and cut and cut. Everybody else has had more time. And we've extended more to you as well. Just wanted to make note of that. But if I could ask if you could wrap up your comments. Sure. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. And thank you for the time. Uh, actions speak louder than words. CUNY talks a good game on adjuncts telling us that they value us, then pay us less than full-time McDonald's workers earns when the hours we must actually put in add up. Um, we adjuncts are not other, we're not inferior. We are people who give of ourselves in order to make fu the future better for all New Yorkers. Michael Powell said that we can choose to be good. He also said that he believed the answer to the question of whether we are making his father's still making his father's kind is up to us. I urge the council to see all adjuncts and faculty for who we are. I urge you to use your power to create a CUNY that can choose to be good. Um, adjuncts are irrepla irreplaceable resource worthy of investment and allies, providing, allies in providing superior education. When uninsured, underpaid adjuncts must take must take time away from their academic work just to survive, how many Colin Powell's will we lose? Uh, I thank you for your time. And my only last comment is that my fear is that the next states person to walk the halls of CUNY may do so on her way out the door, her degree incomplete, never to return to higher education again. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony, Jane We, um, I will now turn to Jonathan Hannon. You may be testify. You begin your testimony. Start. 
starting time. Thank you. My name is Jonathan Hannon, and I'm a PhD student at the Graduate Center and an adjunct lecturer at John Jay College and Brooklyn College, as well as the Vice Chair for Technology Affairs for the University Student Senate. Let me begin by addressing the elephant in the room, which is the precarity of adjunct employment. Adjuncts are hired on a semester to semester basis without any security for future semesters. As a USS delegate to the CUNY Graduate Center, my campus has mostly PhD students, most of whom are also adjuncts, many of whom were laid off during the pandemic without any income other than from unemployment, causing them to lose health insurance. And as James said earlier, there were 2,800 adjuncts that were laid off. This is a problem. Where, there are CUNY, where are CUNY's priorities? Why are adjuncts not seen as a priority at CUNY when CUNY relies so heavily on adjunct employment? When we're talking about the New Deal for CUNY, whose budget was recently passed by the CUNY Board of Trustees and we're discussing today, we see that there is an intent for more full-time lecture alliance to be created. However, there is one key demographic which is omitted from this, current adjuncts, including PhD students. PhD students who are just beginning their studies are not allowed to receive a master's degree until they have completed their entire coursework with PhD. And by the time they finish this coursework, there will not be any more full-time lines to be allocated to them. Current adjuncts, many of whom are teaching on the way to their master's degrees, will be caught at the short end of the stick and not be able to benefit from this. If we look at historical hiring practices, Typically, CUNY prefers to hire from outside of its system, from what they would consider more elite institutions, leaving its own alumni, students, adjuncts, and even administrators sometimes behind. This is unacceptable, and I feel that as elected officials, it is the city council's responsibility to hold CUNY accountable for these egregious hiring practices, and I'm glad to see that that is what the city council is doing today. We need to ensure that our own benefit and we need to give back to our own system rather than hiring from outside. CUNY says that it tries to assist its own students and alumni in finding jobs. And yet when push comes to shove, when it's time to literally put their money where their mouth is, the CUNY community itself is never the priority. By not hiring our own, CUNY is contributing even further to the lack of employment opportunities available to its community. And this starts with adjunct employment. We need to discuss this problem and year after year, CUNY brings it up and yet never does anything about it. You need to bring jobs back to your own community. You need to provide job security to your adjuncts. You need to make more opportunities available for your students who are currently pursuing graduate degrees. CUNY, you need to do better. Thank you, Chair Barron. Um. Thank you for, for your testimony, Chair Barron. I will turn to you for any questions for this panel before we, uh, before we go to our final panel. Uh, thank you, Ms. Briggs. And I wanna thank all the panelists for sharing your positions. And I think that your personal uh, insight is important and your perspective from your having been uh, employed by CUNY or working with CUNY or in the union and seeing a certain perspective is one that is very helpful. I do want to extend uh, my condolences for those who've lost loved ones, uh, whether through the pandemic or just through other kinds of circumstances. And certainly it does highlight the fact that when there are folks who don't have health insurance, it can have a devastating and even deadly impact on, on the services that they can access. Uh, I do agree with what you're talking about in terms of having faculty appointments that reflect equity and having uh, adjuncts appreciated and appointed and acknowledged for the work that they do. And highlighting, uh, as Mr. Hannon talked about, the restrictions from uh, those who are presently working and. PhD candidates for not being a part of this consideration. And I think that that's something that we will look at and as we move forward, try to have CUNY respond to all of that. And we do, as was indicated earlier, send additional questions. So the fact that CUNY is not here doesn't mean that they won't be informed as to the concerns that you raised. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will now call on our final uh, panel of public 
witness test witnesses. Um, I will call in the order of speaking. It will be Deshanta Meredith, Parisa Osmanovich, and Pamela Jean Stemberg. Deshanta, you may now begin your testimony. Starting thank time. You. Hello. Um, thank you, Chair Barron, and your wonderful staff and this panel for allowing me to speak today. I'm a little nervous. Um, I am the president of Local 2054 under DC 37, and I represent the New York City College Assistants. I really hate after sitting here listening to all the things that's being said on both sides uh, with CUNY and the people are testifying. I really hate that I haven't been here prior. Um, my people also was affected very badly um, due to the pandemic. CUNY actually let go of over 4,000 of my people and without notification, without having a discussion with us, um, we found out after I um, requested a listing of my people, they didn't even send letters to um, the employees. They just simply decided on September 1st to just not reappoint anyone, just got rid of them. Normally their reappointment was annually and they started to reappoint my people month by month. What my people do, they are the backbone of CUNY. If you go to any department in this university, you will find my college assistants. They are advisors. They are admission advisors. They are financial aid advisors. They are academic advisors. They're in the health service department. They are the tutors. They're the in-class support. They do everything. They are the jack of all trades. They are the backbone. They are the ones who help carry this university through this pandemic. If you picked up a phone, you will not find upper staff. You would have found a college assistant. My college assistant answered the phone and servicing students. And that was the issue with this pandemic. If you notice, even with um, PSC and the adjunct, the non-teaching adjunct, I was a non-teaching adjunct, they got rid of the support for the students and they wonder why you lost so many students. You wonder why so many students left. I'm a mother also, and I'm gonna speak about that, but I wanna go back to my members. They talk about that they had to do all these budget cuts. I have 81 college assistants do the CUNY practices they were hired at 35 hours. According to our contract, they only supposed to work 1040. These people have worked from 15 to 35 years for the university. You know how they repaid them? On July 1st, 2021, not 2022. Time. They decided, can I continue? Yes, you may. Thank you. July 1st, 2021, they, what they did was they took these people and reduced them from 35 hours to 20 hours a week. These are black and brown people that was dedicated to the university and they basically chopped their lives in half. So when, um, on May 24th, 2021, they notified these people that they were gonna lose their hours. And you know what their comment? After approximately all these years of being um, loyal employees, oh, you have to get a, you can go out and get another job. Really? These people are not young. A lot of these people are almost retirement age. During a pandemic, you're gonna tell these people that, oh, you should, you're able to go out there and get another job. I'm in my 50s now. It's difficult for me to go out and get a job. And for you to take that type of attitude or stance on these people that have been loyal to university, university is ridiculous. These people have been abused for many years. We are stuck under a contract for 50, over 50 years the same contract, it never changes. That contract is older than me. That contract is 
older than the leader of DC 37. My members, I have 18 year old babies, 20 year old babies, and they are stuck working under work conditions from the late 60s, early 70s. How does that happen? Well, the reason why, because well, in a contract, both sides have to agree on any changes. And if it's benefit you, everything about you, it benefits, you are not going to be willing to change anything. We don't have, we have people that have been around 15, 20, 35 years. They don't have sick time. They don't have vacation time. We don't have holidays. I look at the people, the leaders of New York City and New York State, and they make all these laws that have people have time off to take care of their children, go to the doctors, but you forget about the city workers you forget about the state workers you forget about us i know you want to ask a question <laughs> you know it, it really it's a very difficult thing for me because i hear the struggles of these people that i represent these are just not my members these are my family this is my sisters these are my brothers through the pandemic people lost their medical coverage they kept 4,700 of them, but guess what they did? They sliced their hours. They lost their medical coverage. We paid CUNY over a half a million dollars out of our wages, our raises to have full-time coverage. They sliced their hours down so they couldn't have medical coverage through a pandemic. I had people going out, picking up cans, their neighbors putting cans in front of their doors so they can pay their rent, so they can pay their mortgage, so they can eat. Do you know how that makes me feel as a human being to look at my someone calling me that I care about? I talk to my members. I work with my members. I don't send people to represent me to them. I talk with them. I'm involved with them to tell me that they don't have food on their table. They're going to bed hungry. That, that takes a toll on me. And after this pandemic, what really, really, really struck me on the way that CUNY really see my people and the people that work under them as really a way that I, I just could never have imagined. I'm an African-American person. I'm an African-American woman. I was bused to school. I was bused to school. My family fought through the civil rights movement. I'm from Alabama, I was born there. My family went through those struggles and I sat in a room in March of 2021 for CUNY to tell us that, oh, we voted to have Juneteenth as a holiday, as a holiday. But you turn around and say, well, you know what? Your group is not going to get paid for the holiday. We're not asking to get paid for holidays that we're not working. You just totally diminished us. And I sat there with 33 people, the only American, African-American wanted to have anything to do with the, um, as a descendant to slavery, the only one. And those people, Mrs. Um, Spironson got off of this, um, off of this, what, um, off because he knew I was gonna talk about him. I explained to them exactly how it made me feel, how it made my African-American members feel. And you know, he looked at me like I had three heads, Ms. three Mark, heads. I hear, I hear the, I'm angry and I'm, I'm passionate that you have for this situation and uh, we share that and it was brought to our attention a little earlier but I'm going to ask the council to continue so that we can uh, move for other persons and offer questions okay Ms. Briggs Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Meredith, for your testimony. I see that we have another panelist with their hand raised. I would just like to remember we have other testimony that we have to get through, but at the end, we will do a catch-all um, and we'll do our best to get back to you. Um, but for now, I would like to call on Parisa Osmanovich, if you are still available. Yes. Starting time. I'm sorry if my voice is a little shaky, that um, the testimony hit very close to home. Thank you, Ms. Meredith. Um, I'm Parisa Osmanovich. I am a third year doctoral student at the Graduate Center. I'm also the sole uh, university faculty senate liaison from the Graduate Center as a doctoral and graduate student council um, elected representative for that position. I do not have a voting 
um, position on that Senate, which is effectively the conduit between the faculty and CUNY Central. So doctoral students, adjuncts, are not able to actually vote on conditions or any type of constitutional amendments that are communicated to CUNY Central. And I think that really speaks to the contempt that CUNY Central has for its adjuncts because you don't want more representation from adjuncts um, alongside your faculty and you don't wanna hear anything that we have to say via a vote. Um, as an unfunded third year doctoral student, the pandemic hit in the second semester of my first year as a doctoral student. Um, I was left with no work. I lost my job. My entire family was sick. I ended up with blood clots in my lungs from COVID and no type of you know reassurance that I was going to have health insurance. Um, that being said, I had through the absolute grace and generosity of individual faculty members within my department who contributed individual monetary gifts to my family throughout the pandemic, I was able to actually have some type of support. But that was not CUNY. Those were good people that happened to be at CUNY. Um, I do want to say, as, as far as being an adjunct, I'm working now as an unfunded doctoral student. I'm teaching three classes at Hunter this semester. I do not have any type of uh, security for next semester. I'm six months pregnant. I don't know if I'm going to have health insurance when I deliver my baby next semester. I do not know. Um, if my, the rest of my kids are going to have health insurance, because our entire family depends on this health insurance, my pay for each of the classes that I teach is around $3,000. Being that I have no other income, I'm not funded. Let me reiterate that. My peers, there is a hierarchy between the doctoral students that are hired as adjuncts. Some of them are funded. They receive a $28,000 fellowship every year which as you know, in New York City is absolutely not enough for rent. And then some of us are unfunded, which means that CUNY only pays for our tuition and then offers us these teaching gigs, these one-off teaching gigs that are not really secure semester after semester. And so I'm one of those. I don't have any other income other than the three classes I teach, which amounts to around 10K, just around 10K for the semester, for the year. If I were to get those three teaching classes again next semester, which have not been offered to me Done. because they don't know, um, that would be $20,000 income for the year. As a mother of three small children, as a pregnant woman, <laughs> you know, this is insane to me that there is absolutely no consideration for the people who are um, coming, being trained by CUNY that want to work at CUNY. We have experienced my students, I, all of my classes are between 30 to 35 students. They're all students of color coming from low income backgrounds. They're faced with the type of precarity that nobody in this administration could ever fathom throughout this pandemic without work, their family members losing work, having to struggle to find work to support their families. And then also having the tiniest barriers, meaning the difference between whether or not they can stay in school or have to drop out. So as Ms. Meredith said, your falling numbers are a huge reflection of your contempt for your students, including those who are teaching your students. And as one of those people, I just wanted to give my testimony so that you could put a, a face to these adjuncts that are suffering um, and the types of conditions that we're dealing with. Um, I would like to have access to more data that shows what percentage of our adjuncts are doctoral students. And how many of those are being offered positions, you know, for those full time positions that are getting allocated huge sums of money because as Jonathan mentioned, so many of our faculty are not coming, you know, directly from CUNY they're out we're competing with the entire country's job market and every single time it looks like they want someone from Harvard or Yale or Stanford or Berkeley you, you do not respect your own. And what does that communicate to your teachers and people who want to, you know, come here? And that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I will now call on Pamela Jean Stenberg. Starting time. Hi. Um, that was very moving testimony. Um, and Ms. Meredith and, and um, Parisa's testimony are both just, you know, they, they 
they really speak to exactly what's happening at CUNY and has been happening. And it's just increased and magnified by the pandemic. Um, good morning. I have prepared speech, but I have to kind of get back to it because, um, because you know, this, just this inequity in, in the faculty and, and how CUNY treats us is, it's just such a raw issue. And so, um, so, you know, it's so true. There's no respect um, for, you know, for those who teach their students. So that means really there's no respect for the students. Um, anyway, good morning, Chair Barron. And thank you for the opportunity to testify on adjunct faculty employment this morning. Um, I really appreciate the, the committee here too. Um, I'm an adjunct assistant professor at Ostos Community College and the City College of New York. I'm a full-time, part-time faculty member. I earn most of my income from teaching between these two schools, and I teach the same course load, sometimes more, as full-time faculty while earning less than half of the salary. Um, recently, under the pandemic, I lost classes because part-time faculty, and this is so insulting, were asked to understand that other part-time faculty needed classes, so they had to kind of split the crumbs. Um, and, you know, I lost 25% of my income, but I know there are lots of people who've lost, lost more than I have. Um, I'm not getting, I haven't gotten it back. I don't know if I'm going to get it back, but, you know, this is austerity where the poor are asked to share their meager earnings with each other because we're precarious and fungible, right? Um, I don't have a full pass to full-time employment and stability, and no part-time uh, faculty member does. Most of us are precariously employed, and we lose our jo jobs or have classes cut one semester to the next. You know, during the pandemic, we lost 2,000 professors, and though they might have been brought back, they have a break in service, which means they have no rights to accumulated benefits, such as health benefits or step increases, and there's semester to semester appointments, so they're even more precarious than before. CUNY wants it this way. I once heard a university administrator refer to this system as nimble. And Provost Lemon said, part-time faculty are tied to students' enrollment, like so many widgets in a factory being manufactured just in time. Is this really the way we think of people who educate New Yorkers, like just in time for em employees? You know, we have long serving adjuncts who deserve a path to full time. Um, oh, can I just go a little longer? Um, yeah, yes, you may. Okay. You know, and I, I'll just end it with this. Now we're told we have to apply for jobs that we already do. And I think this is insulting. We, sh we do these jobs already and deserve to have a path to full time lines. Now we're being told we can apply for them with the rest of the country. You know, I don't think that this is equitable or fair or, or you know, respects the people who actually do the major share of the teaching at CUNY. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Chair Barron, if you have any questions for, these, for our last panel, um, and I understand we had another panelist who had a question, if you'd like to just point to her as well. Uh, well, well, I'll make my comments and uh, observations on this panel, and then we can see about uh, the panelists' concern. Uh, I, I really want to thank each of you for your very uh, personalized and passioned and moving testimony based on what in fact is the reality that you're living with. Uh, it's always interesting to have those who are the uh, persons involved give their perspective because the institution oftentimes doesn't want to put that out there, tries to keep it obfuscated. And if we don't hear directly, we are only limited to what it is that the, uh, that the administration will present. So it's interesting to know that uh, the situations that you talked about are ones that you're facing. Uh, and perhaps we can't see if the comment that was just made on why should we have to apply for jobs that we already are doing, perhaps then that would be an opportunity for 
some language in the in the announcement that's going to go out that you'll be grandfathered in or you'll have some advantage or that you'll have some preference. So there are things that can be considered and, and we can see how it is that we can work with PSC to try to incorporate that into some language of what, of what, is that, uh, of what it is that would be equitable and fair. And in terms of the, uh, the uh, college assistance, we were informed of that, I think in, in May or June. And we certainly had hoped that CUNY would give again in an opportunity of equity, grand, let's grandfather those who are there, who are doing the 35 hours. Those coming in new might be limited to that. And over a period of time, uh, we could uh, have some equity in that regard as well. But CUNY wasn't willing to do that and we weren't able to accomplish that. And here we're hearing about so much of bureaucracy and so much of greed from a capitalist system that looks to squeeze and get the most that they can out of the workforce. Uh, it was someone who used the term, uh, I think it was, maybe it was Ms. Abbott who had talked about uh, indentured servitude and it's a kind of model of that as we hear about your individual instances and concerns. But uh, the hours late, uh, Ms. Ms. Briggs, you can raise the person who wanted to um, make comment briefly. Yes, that was um, Linda Pelk. Yeah, I Party just wanted time. to say, thank you. I just wanted to say a word on behalf of the college assistants. I work in TELC and there are college assistants who have been there for over 30 years, as mentioned by Meredith, and they were cut those hours. And yet, as you know, as you've mentioned, Chair Barron, they are the ones that keep the program together. They work so hard. And two of them, I know for a fact, are near retirement and yet they were cut those hours. And that hurt me more than my colleagues because I know them and I know they have dedicated so much to the program. And yet the administrators of TELC, of which there are five, were not cut at all. Five administrators and three secretaries. Who do most of the work and who were cut? It's a horrible thing. And I just wanted to speak on behalf of that in my own experience. Thank you. Thank you. I see two more raised hands. I can give you each one minute because we do have to conclude our hearing. Ms. Briggs. Yes. I believe Mr. Hannon was first, Jonathan Hannon. Starting time. I just wanted to mention about the fact that we were saying that we can discuss this with the PSC. If we discuss this with the PSC, we have to remember that the PSC is mostly full-time faculty members. And so we need to have a body that will interest in the current interest of the part-time faculty members and adjuncts. Because if we don't have a body that specifically represents adjuncts and part-time faculty members, then how can their interests be properly represented? Thank you, Chair Barron. Thank you. And Ms. Jillian Abbott? Starting time. Uh, th thank you for that too. Uh, first, I, I just want to say, like I've been almost moved to tears by the things that I've heard today, and I know they're all true, because I've seen every, I've seen all this stuff. And one of the things that I wanted to tell when I was at Queensborough Community College, because we're all shit, you know, one of the things they they do with the, with the subhuman units of labour is push us from college to college, but there was an event with food one day and the person in charge of all the college assistants at the end said oh don't throw that in the bin I need to give it to the college assistants they're all hungry and and meaning they don't have enough to eat in their regular life and then the other thing that I wanted to ask about or to almost beg for is some protection in the in the appointment process if they are conversion lines um, when with the three-year contract which I got I think because of the passionate um, testimony I did last time um, I think I think they heard me but um, uh, okay well well please give us some protection that that people can't pick the favorites that it's if we do a good job we get the job that thank you uh, thank you 
all, thank you very much. I appreciate your coming, taking the time and adding to the discussion about what it is that we need to examine as CUNY has the opportunity here and now to move forward to improve things. Uh, thank you all again. And I do want to thank my team for the work that they do, for the preparation that they give in terms of doing the briefing papers for me and for all of the uh, pointers that they give and all of the signals that they send. I really appreciate it. And I certainly have to thank as well, all the sergeants at arms and all of the technical people who make this run so smoothly and so seamlessly and uh, just appreciate all that you do. So with that, I will find my um, shake away and declare that this hearing is now.